Hi everyone, welcome back to the show. My guest today is Dr. Sean Thornley, medical doctor, general practitioner and anesthetist at the Take Care Clinic. Today we are going to discuss an extremely important topic and something that too many of us put off until we have a real problem, and that is medical screening. The long-time listeners of the show will all agree that prevention is better and cheaper than cure. So in this episode, we are going to discuss exactly what you should be screening for every year to ensure that you live a long, healthy and happy life. Dr. Sean, thank you for taking the time to join me today. Thanks very much, Nikki. Let's start with your thoughts on why people in general leave basic screening and testing until a problem comes up. I think a lot of us uh, think we're invincible and I think we, we, we go through life um, reactionary to problems as opposed to preventing issues and I think you know it's also a um, financial reason for people they they're not prepared to pay the, the, the money that's required to 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 do screening regardless of what that might be whether it's lab tests or uh, breast imaging etc so and um, happy to pay when there's a, an actual problem but but not happy to necessarily go out and, and and look for a problem that might uh, be, be, be very early. And I think that the whole definition of screening is trying to pick issues up in someone that doesn't have any symptoms, or if we do pick something up, pick it up at a very early stage so that we can hopefully prevent uh, consequences from, from, from leaving it too late. Yeah, and I think a lot of people are fearful, you know, finding out, you know, if they feel sort of okay, um, there's a big fear base of what, what if something is there that, you know, I'm going to have to deal with, what if there's cancer? Okay. And what I'd like to really do today is dispel a lot of those fears and really sort of, I'd like to encourage people and maybe even challenge people to set up those appointments now in December so that come January, February, it's all done. It's out of the way. Um, you do it for yourself. You do it for your children. And, you know, it's done for the year and most of the time, um, maybe you can be more specific with statistics, but I'd say like 70% of the time, maybe even more, there's really nothing alarming unless you are way down the road with an illness. Most things can be sorted out and prevented when you catch them early. So I'd love to dispel some of those fears and hope that people start, you know, going to the new year with a frame that they're going to, yeah, start the year off on a good note and you know at least it clears up your mind so what are in your mind you know are the most important things you know if you've got a limited budget and you know you're a person of which say between 30 and 50 what are the things that you should be putting a uh, male or female or both uh, as a priority if you can only choose five or six things to look at and to go and test for at the beginning of the year what should those things be so I think a, a general checkup with your primary care physician, uh, your general practitioner is really, really important to do once a year. Um, so you'd come in, you'd uh, have a history taken from you, find out if you have any concerns, have a proper thorough physical examination done, which would include your height, your weight, your waist circumference, take a look at your blood pressure, your heart rate, your heart rhythm, mm -hmm. Uh, feel your pulses in your arms. Feel the pulses in your feet. Uh, take a look at your um, at your at your ears and your throat, uh, your ENT system. Um, uh, feel your tummy. Make sure that there's no issues there. Listen to your heart and your lungs. And uh, perform a, a very simple urine test that could look for sugar, proteins, infections, liver byproducts, etc. So I think the, the 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 first point of call would be to see a general practitioner and have a proper physical examination done and thereafter to do the appropriate blood tests once a year depending on your age depending if you're a woman and obviously depending on your history but um, a, a baseline panel of blood tests that gets repeated on a yearly basis uh, that can watch trends is really important for for monitoring your health mm -hmm. um, and then depending uh, I mean the the, 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 the the most common cancers that we need to try and pick up and and, and detect early. Um, for example, skin cancers uh, in South Africa, um, seeing a dermatologist or seeing a general practitioner to do a, a skin check, um, breast cancer for women, so, so breast screening, especially in someone that's got a first degree relative uh, who's had breast cancer themselves. Um, pap smear testing for women to, to uh, pick up early changes in um, uh, to, to try and prevent cervical cancer. Mm -hmm. Prostate checks for men after the age of 40, 
and then uh, gastrointestinal, that's colon and, and stomach cancer screening, um, really, really important. So I think um, if we're going to talk about the, the, the blood tests that we'd recommend for people, something so simple as just to take a look at your, uh, your, your endocrine system, your metabolism, and make sure that the cholesterol levels are all normal, or make sure that the sugar is normal, the insulin is normal. Um, uh, look at the thyroid. These are really important things that uh, you can pick up issues with early and really keep someone asymptomatic um, with, with minimal yeah, medication. Yeah. And, you know, your bloods are the least invasive of them all, and it gives you so much to go on. And especially if you really regular testing your bloods year on year, you've got something to compare to. And I've seen so many people over the years come in and they say, well, you know, I've had normal blood pressure my whole life or normal cholesterol. Now it's, it's gone way out. And like they don't realize, you know, these things can happen. And there's so many lifestyle factors that affect this. But because we're so busy doing life and so busy just getting on with things and putting our heads down and working that we, we don't really, we, we slowly sort of normalize not feeling very well um, until, you know, there's, there's a crisis. So, uh, you know, there's also a lot of doctors who don't really look at endocrine. They they don't test thyroid. They're not very thorough. So I think it's also quite important for people listening who are very um, wanting to be more proactive is to have a good relationship with your GPs. You know, always find someone you can have a, an honest conversation with that you don't feel intimidated by. Many people feel intimidated by their, their healthcare practitioners, which is ironic because these are the people we should be having our most honest conversations with. And, you know, mental health as well is not something we can screen for, but these can be screened by conversation. And, you know, nobody really talks about that. You, know, you can't go, I mean, you can go and do a brain scan. I mean, but that would be an extreme. But having these conversations with people or somebody that you can establish trust with is a way of screening whether or not you're okay. And we think we're okay until there's a crisis. So let's, you know, I, I, you know what should we do with, you know, while we're talking bloods, how early on should we be looking at some very basic blood tests with children, for example? So look, I think, uh, you know, it, it all depends on the history of the of, of the patient and, and, and the family history as well and whether or not there are any uh, problems or concerns. So as a, as a sort of rule of thumb, we don't test children routinely because they, uh, you know, we don't just test children routinely unless they're weight issues, um, uh, educational issues, um, suspicions for iron deficiencies and vitamin B level problems, etc. So obviously, it, it, you know, to, to subject children to having uh, uh, needle pricks from from the uh, from the blood test is obviously a concern. So um, unless there's something specific or, or, the, or the child is gaining weight, and so I think if we could just yeah. quickly touch on that, if we could go to to screening in in newborn mm -hmm. screening in children, etc. So I think that it's important for for parents to realise that doing regular assessments of your child's height, weight, waist circumference. Um, and just plotting that on a, on, a, on, a, on a normal graph and looking for any uh, changes in, 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 in their normal growth trajectory is just something that's so simple to do yeah. for their kids. And if their kids start picking up weight, for example, yes, then fine, we can maybe look at some yeah. endocrine tests for that child at, mm -hmm. at a younger age. As a sort of rule of thumb, and someone that doesn't have any concerns, we normally start checking things like sugar and cholesterol from about the ages of, of 30, unless there's any specific concerns. Um, women, obviously, from a, a pap smear point of view, mm. the gynae, uh, from a gynae check point of view, should have um, uh, at least every three years up until the age of 30, unless they pick up any um, any abnormal cells from a, um, on the pap smear. And then after the age of 30, provided they don't have new sexual partners, probably every five years and then at the same time do um, uh, high-risk genotyping from a pap smear point of view. So, so those sort of standard tests that we'd start doing um, in the young population, we also get an opportunity to screen for sexually transmitted infections um, in people in their teens and, and early 20s when they start becoming sexually active. Um, and then as the years go on, we sort of delve a little bit deeper into the blood tests. Um, we take a look at the organ systems, make sure that the bone marrow is functioning nicely, that the red cells, white cells, platelets are all looking okay. We look at their kidney function, their electrolytes. We look at their, uh, we look at their acid levels in their system. We take a look at their cholesterol. We break the cholesterol down into 
uh, traditionally what's been called the good and the bad cholesterol, although obviously that's very controversial, but I mean, it gives us something to work with. And um, yeah, we look at the liver to make sure that, the, you know, if this person is drinking too much alcohol, it can flag up on the liver yeah. function, function tests already at the age of, uh, in their 20s and their 30s. And so, I mean, these are really simple things that you can do with, with one small uh, injection in the arm that you can then track and monitor with, yeah. with time. Yeah, and it, it does, I mean, it saves lives. So probably the most, I don't know, least appealing testing is your colonoscopies. You know, people avoid going and having gastroscopies unless they've really suffered with, with gut issues. And it's because it is invasive, but... I mean, colorectal cancer is one of the most common forms of cancer. It's also one of the most curable if it's caught in its very early stages, um, but it's lethal if it's not. So can you talk us through how that all works? And, you know, most people who go and have it done, they come back and they they go, well, that was actually not so bad. It's not as bad as I thought because pretty much you're anesthetized through the whole process. Uh, but there's a bit of prep that's involved. So can we demystify that? And also chat about briefly what what you a doctor would look for when you go and have a screening, and also what age you should be starting that from. Yeah, so I think you know a big issue with the screening for for men and for women is the invasiveness of the actual procedures themselves, or at least the patient's perceived um, expectation for how invasive yeah. the, the, the the screening test is going to be. Um, you know, for women, having a pap smear done is yeah. is invasive. Uh, for a man to have a rectal examination done and to have his prostate examined is invasive. Um, breast imaging uh, in terms of mammograms is uncomfortable for women. Um, and then obviously the, the colonoscopy, coming back to your question there, is really, it's really important, especially if the patient has got a family history of colon cancer uh, or a history, a family history of polyps, for example, um, it's really important to pick these tests up, uh, to pick these problems up early. And there are non, there, there are relatively non-invasive tests that you can do. For example, a once a year uh, fecal occult blood test to look for hidden blood in the stool. And that, that can be done uh, from yeah. an earlier age and uh, is, is, is really non-invasive. So in the comfort of your own throne, you collect a small sample of your stool and you send it off to the lab and, and, and look for hidden uh, hidden blood. And if that test's positive, then obviously investigations can be done further. But um, probably from around the age of 50 and thereafter every five years, um, more regularly if the, the there's a problem that's picked up. But, but from the age of 50, I think you should at least consider giving yourself a, the birthday presence of a, of a yeah. colonoscopy. And um, it really isn't as bad as what, what people think it is. Uh, you know, it's usually done under sedation these days. And so the, the worst part of it is just the bowel prep to clean the, to clean the bowel out. And that's obviously not a, a pleasant thing to go through, but it's only for a, for sure. a couple of hours and, until the bowels are empty. And, and uh, you know, it kind of gives you that peace of mind that if you do pick something up early uh, or if there are polyps, those polyps can be removed. And uh, you can you can very... You, know, you can really prevent problems from occurring as opposed to treating them when they're really Yeah, unsafe. I think, yeah, I think, you know, treating a problem is more scary than getting a test done, you know, if you really think about it. So, yeah, I'd love to just, you know, if we can do anything here is encourage people to just, you know, bite the bullet, go get it done. And most of the time you're going to be fine uh, and just get it over with. But just to go back to what you said about the controversy around cholesterol. So heart health and the risk of heart attack, it's very real. People are having heart attacks and strokes all of the time. Some people are really fit and healthy and have normal blood lipid levels and they're still having strokes and heart attacks. So what are the other tests that we can do to make sure that, you know, the, the arteries are healthy, that our cardiovascular system is functioning optimally, you know, where we are not seeing, I mean, I like to test such uh, things such as homocysteine and other inflammatory markers because they tell us, a lot more than just your, your base lipid levels. So we want to look at triglyceride levels as well, because that gives a person a lot more information than just, you know, what's going on with your HDL and LDL. So what about things like, um, 
you know, Doppler scans and you know, full body scans. You know, there's there's some really sophisticated ways of of measuring calcification in the arteries and plaque deposits. What in your mind, if you had to see someone who you think would be high risk, ir- irrespective of what's going on in the blood, what would be the next step to really, you know, create some kind of insurance that this person is is either a candidate for a stroke or heart attack or not? Uh, again, I think it all comes back down to taking the, the, the correct history from the patient and finding out if they've got any family history of, of early heart disease uh, in, in their mother or their father or grandparent, for example. Um, that, that's such a simple question and really kind of guides you down the right path. Is this patient a cigarette smoker? Do they exercise regularly? So a high cholesterol level um, very often is not correlated with underlying vascular disease. So you're 100% correct. Um, such simple tests like the, there's a blood test called high sensitive CRP, a really amazing test that, that looks at cardiovascular risk. And you know, value under one is considered low risk, one to three moderate risk and above three high risk. So in someone that's got a very, very, very elevated uh, CRP inflammation marker, you may think, okay, I'm, I might need to be a little bit more aggressive in treating the patient. So in, in terms of actually looking at the blood vessels, so as opposed to going and doing an angiogram on this person's heart, yes, they're non-invasive methods of looking at blood vessels like a carotid ultrasound where they're actually put a little bit of jelly on your neck and take a look at the carotid arteries and they can look at the what's called the intima media thickness, the two layers of the uh, of the, the blood vessel wall, and they can say low risk, intermediate risk, or high risk for, for vascular disease. And that's such a simple test as, as like a woman would have an ultrasound done during pregnancy to look at the baby. You can look at the, the blood vessels in the neck and in the groin. And if that was completely clear, well, then you, you, you know that you probably have some time to try and correct this with diet, exercise, and lifestyle changes as opposed to just throwing medication at patients. Yes, there are other tests that, that, that are more expensive, uh, like coronary artery mm-hmm. calcium scores, for example, that can give you a, a relative risk b- before considering, obviously, things like angiograms. Uh, there, there are stress ECGs that the patients can do. They can exercise on, on a treadmill, for example. You can do resting ECGs to look at the heart. So there's lots of different tests that you can do to, to, to monitor and uh, and manage heart health and cardiovascular mm. health. Yeah, of course. And a while ago, I did a, a show. I was talking to a dentist who was talking about you know gum disease and how that affects our our heart health. And you know, you wouldn't normally put the two together, but where we've got a lot of blood flow, like in the mouth, and there's a, a lot of bacteria, people aren't really looking after their gum and, and dental health. That can really affect our brains, and it can affect our hearts. And, you know, many people visit the dentist. There's another area where people are really tend to be phobic. No one likes going to the dentist. Can you talk to us a little bit about the the importance of that dental checkup and dental hygiene when it comes to a systemic inflammation and health for the body in general? You know, yes, they're, they're obviously looking at your teeth and they're looking for cavities and they're, 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 they're looking at fillings and those sort of things. But like you say, they can look at, uh, at gum disease, gingivitis, and there's a correlation with, um, with gingivitis and heart disease uh, as well as systemic inflammation. So um, they don't just pick that up, though. They very often, whilst working in your jaw, tell you, well, I actually think you're clenching. And does that mean you're struggling with uh, stress at the moment? Are you anxious at the moment? So I know it's a, it's not just as simple as, as my teeth are okay. You could, they can really help you in terms of picking up um, uh, other issues. And dentists are really good at picking up things like sleep apnea because of the shape of the jaw and the shape of the palate and sleep apnea being one of the leading causes or contributors to heart, well, not heart disease, but mostly stroke. You know, if you're not breathing at night because you have an obstruction in your, your sinus passages or in your mouth, um, and of their sleep apnea comes from, from a number of reasons, but this is also one of the biggest reasons people have, um, or eventually develop heart disease is because something so simple and so curable can be sorted out early on. And, you know, very often if it's caught early enough, um, just simply losing weight or even getting a, a sort of a, a, um, a dental plate put in your mouth, you don't even have to go as far as getting a CPAP machine can avoid heartache and trauma in the long term. So yeah, it, it really is, again, make those appointments, go see your dentist, go see your doctor and just get it done and save yourself, you know, 
months and months of cost and trauma down the line? Uh, you know, there's really non-invasive tests that you can do. They, they, they've got amazing devices that just wrap around the wrist and, and plug into your finger, for example, that can actually monitor how, how uh, your oxygen levels, your heart rate changes during the night, whether you become apneic, uh, can, can monitor your scoring, etc. cetera. And um, like you say, they can give you reports there that say mild, moderate, and severe. And very often, coming back to the dental from the dentist, they, they can recommend something so simple as a mandibular advancement device, like you say, in, in, in the patient's mouth, that can hold their jaw forward for them and, uh, and stop obstruction to, to blood flow, which really, really helps for early morning headaches, daytime fatigue, um, and risk for heart disease. Obviously, that, that stress of, of be, being apneic at night puts a lot of stress on the heart. Uh, and it's it's so avoidable. So let's just chat before we go into to more about kids and you know th- things that we can do for our children is there are a number of screens or a number of blood tests, for example, that we can do to look at cancer markers in the blood. And there's varying opinions on these um, these tests. Some people say they're really not very accurate. You can't, you know, but do you think that it's worth really doing these once or t- once a year, or once every second year? Do they uncover a potential to go and look further? Is there, is there value? Um, what have you found? Aside from sort of the occult blood, which is more of a physical, you know, it's, it's evidence of blood in the stool. What about the sort of the CA125s and those sort of real cancer marker screenings in your, in your you know, professional opinion? So I think that the PSA prostate marker is a, is a test that I perform routinely on men over the age of 40 on, a, on an annual basis or more regularly if required. And the, the, the problem with screening tests is that you have to look at the sensitivity and specificity of these tests. So how good are, are, are these tests at picking up cancers in someone that does have cancer? And how good are these tests at ruling out something um, in, in someone that, that might actually have a cancer and doesn't test up on a blood test? So uh, as far as my, my training goes, cancer markers are supposed to be used in general to monitor the patient's response to treatment of that specific cancer. Now, that doesn't necessarily mean that I wouldn't do cancer markers, for example, the CEA, CA99, CA125, CA152. There's a whole bunch of cancer markers that you can do for patients, but I have had this happen before where there was an abnormal result and then you go down a rabbit hole of stress for this poor patient where if they had never done anything and not checked the blood test, they wouldn't have to, to worry about that. So um, I think that, that there are certain tests that are appropriate to do on an annual basis. And the only way that these tests would be of real value is to get a, a negative baseline for the patient and do yeah. them on an annual basis, but they yeah. are very expensive and to monitor the trend. For them and obviously if you pick something up early then fantastic but it adds yeah. a couple thousand onto the the the, the, the patient's um, um blood screening yeah it does through the labs and what about testing for <clears throat> early onset say dementia alzheimer's you know what are there really reliable tests i'm sure there's uh, i'm not aware of any sort of blood test markers but in your opinion what are the most reliable ways and how early should we start looking again it's probably comes down to familial you know if there's there's somebody in your family who has dementia but it's something we're seeing more and more of and it's it's really quite terrifying so what can a person do to go and you know go and screen and make sure that you know their, their their sort of mental function is where it should be you know from not even from an age appropriate point of view but to make sure that nothing is going awry so we, we can look at early intervention well sure. i think you know um, I, I get this question asked a lot um, in terms of and you can there, there are alzheimer's disease uh, gene tests that are sure. lipoprotein tests that you can do three four etc and um, that you can do for a patient that can say okay there's a genetic component you just have to ask yourself now what am i going to yeah. do with that information if it's negative what am i going to with that if it's positive what am i going to do with that if it's positive it's is it going to push my stress levels through the roof that i'm not going to enjoy the 
last 20 years before I become before I get dementia and and also if the test is positive it doesn't necessarily mean that that person is going to however if you if you do test it and it tests positive it might give this person a little bit more of a kick to say I need to really look after yeah. my diet exercise lifestyle moderate with my alcohol intake for example but but patients yes. should be doing that regardless so I think uh, I don't test this is routinely I will test it if someone asks me to test them for it but my, 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 my answer to them is look after your your system because whether it's your liver or your heart or your brain they all have blood supply to them they all have blood vessels inside them and you've got to look after your entire system whether it's the brain the liver the kidneys the heart the skin um, and it should be a part of prevention rather than uh, and to to then go and say, look, you you've tested negative now. Are they all of a sudden going to go and live a completely wild life? And because they they're not worried. So I think that that the the right answer is we should be looking after ourselves regardless yeah. of what that test is going to tell you. And are you prepared for whether the test is negative? And are you prepared for whether that test is positive? Um, for for that outcome. Yeah. No, that's that's really well. That goes for everything, you know. And I've seen so often where people come to me with awful results you know whether they've got high you know liver enzymes and terrible blood lipids and sometimes that doesn't even motivate somebody to go and change their lifestyle it's such an individual decision and very often you know you if you can't do it for yourself do it for your offspring make sure you're you're you know you stay cognizant enough and healthy enough to see your grandchildren grow up and if that's not motivation then i don't know what is um but we've all yeah. got to find our reason yeah, absolutely. Yeah. So just going back to the less scary tests and that being things like eye screens and ear, like hearing tests. And, you know, a lot of the schools in the early years do this for, for children to make sure that they can see what's written on the board and they can hear the teacher. But it becomes more and more neglected as as we get older. You know, when you really sort of get into your 40s and you can't see close up or far away anymore, we have no choice but to go and get some glasses. But it's something that is really, really neglected. And it very much, it impedes our quality of life. And I see this a lot with kids who, they don't have learning problems, but they do have some kind of visual acuity issue or a hearing issue. And these things are so solvable and they are so not invasive. What you know? What are your thoughts around those sort of you know more well, sort of less life threatening issues? And where do you see them being neglected? And how important are they? I think they're, they're hugely important. I think the the you know if we take if we take hearing screening in people uh, sort of over the age of 55, 60, you know that the earlier you pick this up, the better your brain is, is at adapting to. For example, a hearing screen, and if you get hearing aids from, from an earlier age, your decline in your hearing um, is substantially less than than if you were to go in 10 years' time, for example. So you might only have 5% hearing loss, um, but if you manage that early, your, your decline would be a lot less rapid as the years go on. So such a simple a screening test as a, as a hearing test, I think, is an absolute no-brainer. Um, I, I test with an optometrist. I mean, they, they've got the most amazing uh, systems and machines and they can look at your retina and show you the most beautiful pictures and look at the blood vessels uh, in your eye. Really, really amazing um, tests that are completely non-invasive. And I think the earlier you pick these things up with children and the earlier you pick things, these things up as you get older, the better it is for for your uh, for your system and um, you know I think that a lot of learning difficulties for children can be avoided or can at least be managed from an early age so uh, as soon as there are concerns raised from a teacher or I think you need to to, to ask these questions um, is there a hearing problem mm -hmm. my child um, staring out the window because he's at the back of the class and actually can't see the the, the board at the front um, is he struggling to hear what the teacher actually says, for example? Um, mm -hmm. So, you know, I mean, my, my little four-year-old boy, uh, he had the most horrendous snoring and that was actually causing terrible sleep apnea for him. And since having had his uh, tonsils out, his, uh, his sleep has improved substantially. And I would imagine that his energy levels as well. So, so picking these sort of things up 
um, early for, for children is really important. And then obviously as the years go on as well, uh, I mean, yeah. I've had a, a hearing test and an eye test within the last year and I find them really interesting. I think that the information you get from them is fantastic. And yeah. it also gives you a baseline for when you're young, you're healthy and you're fit. This is what my hearing was. This is what my visual screening is. And I've now got a baseline to compare to next year when I go. Mm. Yeah, it is. It's about getting that baseline and making sure that as you age, you keep it as close to the, your, your healthy baseline as possible. So yeah, just to go back to the ophthalmic, the reason it comes up for me is because my daughter, I take her for an eye screen once a year and her, her vision has always been fine. But um, what we picked up was that when I took it to a more of a specialized ophthalmologist, they picked up that her eye tracking wasn't working. And this is why she doesn't like to read. And it's not that she can't, she just, it was tiring her out because her eyes were jumping over words. It was just you know, a physical thing that can be very easily sorted out with a little bit of OT. And just a little bit of work and knowing that this is the issue, she suddenly found an enjoyment in reading, which has changed her life at school because it's now making more sense to her. So what she was battling with needlessly before, she's not battling with anymore. And it, it's not invasive at all. But, you know, looking forward, if we hadn't done this, I hate to think how she would have carried on battling and, and not enjoyed you know, school, which is quite a, a scary thing to, to think about, how you can literally hinder your child's progress by not just taking an extra step. And it costs no more than a normal eye exam, you know, to, to go and do this. So there's so many things we can do to just, if you think about it in terms of improving quality of life going forward for yourself and for your kids, it's, you know, the it's such a return on investment, just taking a little bit of time and effort to go out there and screen. Yeah, absolutely. I think, you know, you know, for, for the people listening to this now, I think it becomes quite overwhelming with, okay, right, there's so many different screening yeah. tests. And, you know, I think um, if you can say, do one test sure. a month, pick, pick one test that you could do a month, for example. So maybe see your general practitioner in January, maybe see your nutritionist or dietitian in yeah. February, maybe do a, a, your gynae checks mm -hmm. in March, do your, et cetera. So, you know, you see your dentist in April. If you can do one of these sort of tests, uh, maybe your eyes and your ears in one yeah. month, for example, it really breaks it down into bite-sized chunks that people can can actually tolerate, both financially and also time-wise. And if you take time off work to go and do these sort of things and tests and that as well. But um, I think if you if you just focus on doing one test a month, um, it doesn't have to be every month, you know, but, but, but the main ones – you know, or, or one test every quarter, if it's just going to be, you know, when, you, when you're younger, if it's going to be earlier, I think, you know, it, it just kind of breaks it up. And then, you know, fine, I see my general practitioner every year in yeah. January, and I come from a full medical in January. Yeah. It just makes it so much easier. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and book it in, in advance. I, I In every December, I book everything out for the next six months, and it's there, and it's non-negotiable, and you just plan around it, and it really it becomes yeah. a non-issue if you do that, but it's really, really important to just get it done. So Dr. Sean, thank you so much for your time today. I'm hoping that this will encourage people to make an appointment and come and see you at the Take Care Clinic and get everything done as soon as possible, or at least within the next couple of months. Um, and of course, we'll put your, your contact details on the, on the show notes. All the details will be there. And I wish you and your family a very safe and happy festive season and a very healthy new year thanks nikki i wish you and your family all the best for december and the last push for 2023 and let's make 2024 a preventative uh, year as opposed to a treatment year so let's hope that we can all sort of do the necessary checks and look after ourselves in 2024 brilliant thank you so much